morning, good afternoon and good evening. We certainly have the great pleasure of talking with one of the world's experts today, Professor Ross, Ross Upshur. And the title of this conversation this morning is From COVID-19 to Climate Change. Can public health ethics aid in a more equitable inclusion of older adults? So it's a big topic for early morning on Friday. Let me tell you a little bit about Ross. And as Bruna puts in, um, uh, Luana puts um, Ross's uh, bio in the chat box, it is lengthy as you would expect. Ross is the Dalalana Chair in Clinical Public Health and Head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalalana School of Public Health. He's also Scientific Director at Bridgepoint Collaborative for Research and Innovation and Associate Director of the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Sinai Health. He has um, many, many positions you know, within the University of Toronto, but also globally, uh, including during COVID, he has served as the co-chair of the WHO Ethics and COVID-19 Working Group and is a member of the WHO Actor Ethics and Governance Working Group. He is an elected fellow of the Hastings Centre and the Canadian Academy of Health Science. So welcome, Ross, to our global conversation. Thank you, Jane. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning. So, Ross, I'm going to start a little way back because I've noticed in reading up about uh, your work and, and who you are and what you're doing, I noticed that you've got the dubious honour having worked on SARS, on MERS to a certain extent, on the H1N1 influenza, um, both Ebola outbreaks. It seems that you missed Zika for some reason directly, but you were peripherally involved, and COVID. Now, what interested me was, you know, outside Asia, Canada was the country that was hardest hit by SARS and hardest hit, the outbreak took 44 lives, threatened many others and created numerous challenges for public health. Um, and when I looked at the data this morning, in Canada, there were almost four and a half million cases of COVID and 46,000, over 46,000 deaths. How come we were so unprepared in Canada and globally for COVID-19? That's, that's a, an excellent question and one I think we all need to collectively reflect on. <clears throat> and it certainly surprised me at how poorly uh, we did uh, respond. Uh, I think like many of us uh, who were involved in SARS-1, and if you, if you recall, uh, there were a series of uh, commissions of inquiry after, after SARS-1 which is the Canadian way of responding to a crisis is to uh, you know, commission uh, inquiries. And, and the length of those inquiries basically exceed the uh, shelf space of the collected works of Proust. And there were hundreds and hundreds of recommendations in those reports. Interestingly, in January of 2020, I was out for lunch with a colleague, Siobhan Nelson, who's the former Dean of Nursing and former Vice Provost at U of T. We thought, oh, you know, it's coming up to the 20th anniversary of the SARS. We should have a, a symposium where we look at all of those recommendations and sort of uh, take a pulse as to how well we've uh, uh, executed towards those. And of course, uh, at that same time, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic was brewing. Now, I thought that we would definitely be better prepared. We had the experience in uh, 20, 2003. We had um, you know, no shortage of recommendations on strengthening public health systems and health system re, uh, response. Um, and there have been a, no shortage of global efforts to improve systems. So for example, the 2003 outbreak spawned a revision of the international health, health regulations, which uh, came into force in 2005. Uh, this was meant to enhance the WHO's uh, capacity to respond to pandemics. But I think what happened was we had 2009, we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic, which was a quote unquote mild pandemic, despite the very considerable morbidity and mortality. And I think it sort of put people off guard. So I had several research projects uh, 
funded at that time to better investigate uh, some of the ethical dimensions of pandemic response. And after that, like people, people just lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and even though in, in some of the presentations I give for headlines from 2003, 2009, they're almost identical to the headlines we've seen in 2020 uh, uh, forward. So it's a part of the reason I think also uh, relates to public health itself. Um, you know, in the province of Ontario, we spend over $60 billion a year on health care. Uh, but our investments in prevention and in system preparedness uh, are a fraction of that cost, and that's the case globally. So when you take a look at health systems globally, you know, a lot of people, a lot of systems have nice paper, I call it, right? If you go to their website or you talk to their leaders, they will show you uh, policies and, and procedures and plans on the shelf that all look very good. Um, but in certain parts of the world, it's a bit like the uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, you pull the sheet back and there's just, uh, there's very little behind. And the World Health Organization is a, is a great example of that. I have huge respect for the WHO, but its budget is only slightly greater than that of one of our largest downtown academic health science centers. Uh, most of, a lot of their budget comes from uh, targeted funding from uh, donors. Um, most of the member states don't make their contributions on an annual basis. So when you go to Geneva and you walk the halls, and I remember the first time I went, I was so excited, and you walk down the hall and there's this sign on the door that says Global Schistosomiasis Program, and you go, wow, that's where all the action in the world in schistosomiasis is happening, and you look in there and there's one guy sitting at a desk with a huge pile of papers. So basically that one person is responsible for the global system. So, so there's a under capacity in, in investment in global public health. The other problem is the WHO is still a nation, it's a UN um, agency, which means that it's at the behest of member states. And what member states say goes, and we still live in a Westphalian internationalist regime. So there's actually nothing that really compels anyone, any interest, be it a nation state, be it a you know, multinational pharmaceutical company, anyone uh, to behave or act in the common good. So there's a lot of veneer that looks like that we're prepared, that looks like people are taking things seriously. Um, but, you know, and we found this out in, in Canada in particular, what happened to our stockpiles of PPI? They were non-existent all around the world, despite repeated claims. And I know coronavirus is not influenza, but having worked on you know pandemic influenza plans since the late 90s, yes, you can't just cut and paste influenza and put COVID down, but a lot of the structures, a lot of the recommendations, a lot of the concerns actually translate over. So this is another failure that we've had uh, throughout all of us. So I'm going on too long, I'll, I'll tie up very quickly. Throughout every outbreak uh, that we've been on, we see the same structural issues over and over again. That's why after the first Ebola uh, outbreak, I wrote a very grumpy paper saying about lessons learned that the only lessons we learn is that we don't like to learn lessons because the structural issues and the normative issues were identical in almost every case. Yet every time it, we have a new outbreak, we hit the refresh button and start from scratch. It's like we have no ability to carry forward accumulated knowledge or we distrust it, or there's lack of continuity and in institutional memory. But we must do a much better job uh, going forward because, and I've said this to others and they don't believe me, we actually got off easy with COVID. We could have imagined, you know, they've had sequential waves, but we could have imagined a much more, uh, you know, virulent uh, um, agent coming with much higher mortality. Um, and of course, we have the really large uh, uh, factor of climate change looming over us, uh, which uh, for which I think we're even less prepared than we were for uh, any of the uh, pandemics that we faced. So Ross, before we go to, to climate change, and I think it's important to unpack climate change and the impact that's going to have on the most vulnerable populations, I want to just take us back to SARS and, and uh, you know, are the issues that we experienced in SARS the same issues that we experienced in COVID? And, and I say that because, you know, we're now sort of almost 20 years post-SARS. 
you know, so we now have the decade of healthy aging. We're talking a lot more about an aging population. Have we learned anything about how to actually support and enable and deal with vulnerable populations in pandemics? Um, and I would say uh, theoretically, yes, uh, in practice, no. Uh, in fact, it's been a catastrophic failure. And uh, so I'm working on this, this paper that kind of tries to fig figure out what the disconnect is. Uh, because every, every conceptualization of a pandemic, let's say, be it a respiratory, we'll, we'll just stay with respiratory viruses for the time being, um, identifies certain populations as being at particular risk uh, for high mortality and morbidity. And of course, the overarching goals of pandemic plans are to reduce and mitigate um, uh, uh, morbidity and mortality with a particular focus on uh, those vulnerable populations. Now, quote unquote vulnerability, I'll return to this in a minute because we learned some very interesting things in a project we had uh, for uh, pandemic preparedness before H1N1. Um, historically, this has been the case since we've started to write about or become aware of uh, the so-called uh, uh, social determinants of health or developed techniques for measuring differences in populations. So I'm talking going back to the late 18th, early 19th century. So I've been teaching a course on the history, philosophy and ethics of public health. And my students are always amazed. They go, wow, you know, we knew that there were socioeconomic gradients and neighborhood differences uh, since like 1830. Yes, wow, people of <laughs> particular populations are disproportionately affected by infectious diseases. Yes, all of this is exceedingly well known and has been put into the fabric of public health response. So how, to, and, and the issue of vulnerability is an important one. It's a language that policymakers use. We had a grant um, in the late aughts for pandemic preparedness and uh, was the only grant I've ever got where there was no research question because I said, we don't know what the questions are until we bring uh, uh, people together. So we had three groups that had never talked to each other people who were making pandemic plans. So we had people from the federal government, the World Health Organization, the province. We had enactors and enablers of those plans. So there would be professional bodies and their regulators. And then we had the so-called vulnerable populations. So uh, older adults, indigenous populations, shelter populations, people with, dis you know, with disabilities. We brought everybody together. We put everybody in, in, in rooms to talk to each other. And then we had this uh, circle within a circle methodology where everybody would hear what everybody else's concerns were. And the striking thing was from the, uh, the vulnerable populations group. And they said, you know, um, we don't like the term vulnerable you and your policies are what make us vulnerable. The idea here was that there was planomegaly and there was no, it was like there was no Lego blocks connecting the global to the federal, to the provincial, to the municipal, to the institutional and organizational. There was nothing that brought these plans together except for the fact that thou shalt have a plan. And the people who were meant to be the beneficiaries of the plan uh, felt that the plans were not in their interests whatsoever. In fact, the plans risked putting them at greater risk. And here's the kicker, they were absolutely correct. And so where we had a colossal failure uh, in the first wave of COVID is that we decided, and this is where I, I don't have to bring it up, everybody knows the flatten the curve and you've got the two curves and you've got this hatched line which says health system capacity. So all of a sudden what happened in the wave one is that we left the doors open uh, for long-term care uh, facilities to bear the brunt of mortality. So remember, we knew going in that this was the most vulnerable population. And also, uh, not coincidentally, so how well did our plans work? The highest mortality in Canada, in fact, the highest mortality in long-term care facilities in the world uh, was in Canada. So how good a job did we do at executing on that plan which was to reduce morbidity and mortality and to protect the most vulnerable, a colossal failure. And there's absolutely no excuse for not knowing that these populations would be at the highest risk. We've known this for decades, if not centuries. So yeah, I'm not sure what that actually says, but we've done a, but it's a, it's a failure. If you read the Royal Society of Canada's report on the uh, experience of the pandemic and long-term care, they talk about a colossal failure and it's an ethical failure. It's a failure to care. 
So you can have all the plans in the world that give you priorities and identify populations. If there's nothing in the plan to do, to, to, to connect the dots, to provide that protection, uh, then it's just empty rhetoric in my mind. So I'm a little worked up about this because I've been doing this for such a long time. And it was just so clearly and unequivocally stated in all of the plans. It was not about, but all of a sudden, and this is another part of the paper and another paper that we wrote about uh, lessons learned in pandemics, but it, for SARS-2, we never actually set out goals. And so meme science, so back to that, you know, flattening the curve with the line. One, the original idea of flattening the curve comes from a 2007 CDC preparedness document in which it talks about it being a theoretical construct based on models. And you know we might wanna try to see how non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions could blunt uh, the spread of the disease in the community so that the health system capacity would have more time to prepare. But all of a sudden in SARS, protecting the healthcare system became a goal of pandemic response, which is perhaps the most curious thing I have ever seen. And, 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 and double irony, protecting the healthcare system with public health measures. We've always been, public health's always been the sort of like, uh, you know, noisy, annoying uh, little uh, sibling. Um, and the idea that the system itself, which is meant to actually be a critical enabling uh, factor in responding to a pandemic now becomes an object of protection such that protecting that object leads to the actual death of other people and the royal system and i'm not making this up because the royal society investigation showed acute care empty beds to preserve capacity many of the anybody who works in hospitals in ontario knows a large proportion of hospitalized individuals are older adults with multimorbidity frailty uh, difficulties with mobility, the sort of people that we're, this group is really concerned with. So they got moved up to open up space. Um, and, uh, you know, they were left in, in the crosshairs and the so-called surge, I mean, and everybody I think was also bedazzled. It was truly horrifying. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that there's any easy answers here. When you were watching what was happening in Italy and in New York and in China, it was horrifying. But, but because somebody should have stepped back and said, okay, where, is the, where are the weak parts in our defense and how can we support them? And as the uh, Royal Society report says, you know, uh, the long-term care facilities have been chronically uh, at risk. So again, you know, no lessons learned. They said, you know, we don't need another commission of inquiry. We've had enough. Uh, the, 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 all it did was, it was really amplify the problems that were already extant and well known with devastating consequences. So if the goal of a pandemic response plan is to reduce morbidity and mortality, particularly in those populations that are at highest risk, we failed and we failed miserably and we need to own that and we need to take dramatic steps to make sure that it never happens again. So Ross, I'm just going to actually throw another curly question at you. Healthcare professionals are trusted sources of information. Did healthcare professionals sign up for this? I mean, do you, do you get the sense from healthcare professionals that they were equipped to be able to, you know, respond to this? Yeah. Because we depended, you know, and that goes yeah. for dentists and pharmacists and doctors. What do you think about that? Well, you're, you're, you're poking all of my uh, uh, <laughs> spots. So, uh, so let, me, let me come back to another failure, and that's a failure of, uh, of educational systems. So I first got involved with the World Health Organization. So after SARS-1, we wrote a, a kind of position paper that we uh, published in the British Medical Journal about some of the ethical issues that were raised in SARS-1. Uh, we uh, submitted that to the uh, uh, Naylor Commission. Uh, but the World Health Organization kind of liked the, we, and then we wrote a sort of discussion paper that the World Health Organization took up as the frame for their uh, 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 pandemic response plan. And they, they asked me to chair the working group on health workers' obligations in pandemics. So I spent about two years, uh, and then of course this carried forward uh, into some of the research we did. So did healthcare providers sign up for this? 
Uh, the answer is yes, but they weren't told about it. So after SARS-1, I remember having discussions at the Faculty of Medicine saying, you know, because we can't, and, then, and this is another thing that just completely annoys me because we hear the same thing after each one, like you get midway through and you hear, it's always in the star and, the, and it always raises my blood pressure about 20 points. When a healthcare professional is quoted in the news as saying, I didn't sign up for this. Well, what did you sign up for? Where, where, like, what are they teaching you at school? What questions are they asking you when, when you're being recruited into a, uh, a caring profession? And if you, so we did a really interesting uh, study of codes of ethics of all the health professions uh, and, you know, nursing, medicine, allied health, uh, to look at what they actually stated about duty to care. And the history is actually fascinating. So the very first code of ethics for the American Medical Association and the Canadian Medical Association had a very interesting provision in it. And, and it says, you know, paraphrase, it says, when pestilence prevails, well, that is when there's an epidemic or a pandemic, the pestilence is a late 19th century term, it is the physician's duty to provide care to their patient, even at risk of their own life, right? Very clear, very unequivocal in the originating documents of both the AMA and the CMA. And of course, you will not find it there today. It disappeared actually very shortly after the 1918-1919 uh, uh, pandemic. And one of my retirement projects is to try to get into the archives at the CMA to see if there's any minutes about the discussion about why they decided to take this out. Uh, so I was part of the revision of the last code of ethics uh, just a couple of years ago uh, when it became the code of ethics and professionalism. And we tried to bring back this issue. This was in 2017 to 2018. We tried to surface the issue again about whether we should say something about duty to care in an epidemic. And there was no appetite from uh, regulatory authorities or my peers about you know, putting that in again. So, Minimally, and I made this recommendation to the Faculty of Medicine, you know, you ought to tell people who are coming into medicine that epidemics occur, uh, that pandemics occur, that in the course of their, you know, we went through this also in the 90s when HIV was a problem. Remember, there were people who were, uh, there were clinicians who refused to provide care uh, for people with HIV. Uh, you know, we've gone through this uh, several times. So minimally, minimally, somewhere in first or second year of every health profession's training program, there ought to be maybe, a dare, I know the curriculums are crowded and it's a contested thing, maybe five minutes just to raise this little issue so that future nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, paramedics might want to think to themselves whether they've signed up for it. And if they haven't, then you know there's lots of ways in which you can make a living. There's no right to be a doctor; it's a privilege, right? So just because you've got a medical degree, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting worked up again. Sorry. So so just like, but so far, you you know, it's like crickets. Whenever I raise this thing, and really since 2005, when they revised the public health, you know, the international health regulations created this thing called the Public Health Emergency of International Concern, which is the loudest alarm that the Director General of the World Health Organization can ring. We've had uh, H1N1 in 2009, we've had two Ebola's, we've had now monkeypox, SARS, polio has been ringing since 2014, can you hear it out there? Most people don't even know that the Public Health Emergency of International Concern alarm is reading for polio, except when a case landed in New York a couple of months ago. So we've got, again, you know, where do we start? We have health systems in shambles um, who actually are so poorly uh, constructed that they actually need protection despite consuming almost 50% of the public budget, staffed by a large number of, you know, really dedicated, intelligent, caring young people who don't know that they may face this threat. I don't know where the disconnect comes. I'm getting too, really, there's a reason I have no hair. Um, you know, uh, so these are very, very large, substantive, weighty issues that nobody seems to want to face or deal with in a serious and concerted manner. And of course, Ross, coming down the train tracks, we've got, you know, the delays in catch up of immunization yeah. and, you know, massive declines in routine immunization across the world and an increase in um, concern about vaccine confidence. 
Yeah. So we've got all of those issues laid upon. I now want to now take our pandemic, in which we're still in, by the way, yeah. um, and we still need to remain vigilant in Canada and around the world, and actually sit it within the climate change conversation. Because it seems to me that there's layer upon layer of public health issues. And, you know, where does climate change and public health ethics fit when we're coming to talk about equitable inclusion of older adults? Yeah, so this is a, um, something I've been thinking, excuse me, quite a lot about over the last year. I've been trying to uh, participate in a grant that's looking at, uh, it's from, with colleagues in, in the UK and, and around the world on justice and care and um, looming challenges. So uh, I'm, I'm heading up a work package that's trying to wrap my mind around um, uh, climate change and aging and uh, care. And so structurally, you see the same uh, language and rhetoric uh, in documents. So for example, if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which is a thousand page report that came out uh, earlier this year, um, it, they, it, it's, it's eerily uh, similar to our uh, pandemic preparedness documents where they say, oh, here are the here are the vulnerable groups, and who and and you know I could I could uh, have a snap quiz with this group and ask you to identify the vulnerable groups, and of course uh, you would get them all correct because they're the same ones that are the the ones that are at risk of uh, uh, from uh, pandemics, and they're also historically the same groups that have the uh, worst uh, uh, outcomes. So I'm starting to see this uh, striking parallel between the type of reasoning that was put together to prepare for pandemics that's coming forward to uh, prepare for the impacts of climate change. And of course, if my argument has any purchase, our, our, our logic that prepared us for pandemics is probably also equally ill-suited to prepare us for uh, the health impacts of climate change. And one of the, the disturbing quotations uh, uh, I saw, and this is what sort of triggered all of the thoughts that I was uh, articulating earlier, was one of the Lancet Commission reports. So they've had a parallel uh, countdown where they're following uh, trends in climate change, and then they issue a dot. Their last one just came out in September, I think, uh, uh, talking about what the health implications of climate change are. And uh, one, one, one of the, and, uh, sorry, uh, sorry about my dark humor. There, there was a line there about how health systems are going to be crucial uh, to uh, helping populations respond to the health impacts of, of climate change. And I said, oh, really? Just like they did with the pandemic, right? You know, <laughs> we're gonna have the same level of protection for vulnerable populations that we saw for the pandemic. So, uh, you know, with due respect to all of these, uh, you know, very distinguished people uh, who have spent a lot of time preparing these reports, there seems to be a little bit of wishful thinking uh, at, uh, at, 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 uh, uh, at, at work here. So what's so what would public health ethics um, help out with? So there's a, I think there's a, a number of lines of, of reasoning that can come out of this that may may and let me put may in quotation marks with heavy codicils, qualifications, and uh, a fair dollop of skepticism uh, uh, may may provide some uh, ways forward. So one of the things that public health ethics emphasizes is the relational nature of human existence. Um, it talks about the sort of gluey principles that hold us together. And interestingly, in the most recent uh, Lancet Commission report, uh, they talked about the need for pro-social, to support pro-social uh, attitudes. In other words, uh, that's kind of, I think, a, a fancy social scientific way of, what, of, uh, of saying what uh, old school humanities uh, scholars would, would call, you know, humanistically uh, relationality, uh, things like solidarity, um, uh, uh, reciprocity. So the things that hold us together. Uh, because uh, these are huge collective choice and collective action problems that are going to require that we break down 
uh, some of the atomistic, self-interested uh, ways that we think. A lot of that, and this now, you know, as I said, hopeful, really, really speculatively hopeful, uh, which actually for climate change uh, uh, speak to the very way in which we interact with nature and how we generate in and distribute income and goods. And those are deeply, deeply ingrained in, in, in humans. Uh, and so that it's a big, big uphill battle. But unless we want to just, uh, you know, the, the, we have to make some sort of concerted effort to alter the way we behave and think and have to look at how we, so there's a, a quotation uh, from a, a famous uh, uh, logician philosopher, Charles Saunders Peirce, who was actually one of the most astute uh, scholars in scientific in inference and logic. And he talks about the unlimited community and links the very idea of rationality to concern with future generations. And, and he's, it's, a, it's an interesting argument because it starts with uh, understanding what uh, probability is in the first place. So unless we see uh, um, our own individual interests tied up into the interests of those of the future and others, we are well and truly sunk. And so, you know, we can, and, uh, and how we affect that change when we've been unable to achieve very simple things like telling healthcare professionals that in the course of their careers, they may find themselves in a situation where providing care may put them at risk. If we can't achieve that, you know, as I said, five minutes somewhere in the curriculum, maybe reinforced once or twice, um, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I hate to sound totally despairing, but I'm, I'm tilting in that direction. Um, yeah. So Chris, uh, Ross, some of the challenges that we have in our field particularly is um, older women. Older, the, the, the two words older women, you know, if, if we fight hard enough, you know, we might be able to get those two words in a statement at the Commission for the Status of Women example. You know, life course approach to immunization or life course approach to aging, they're fine words, but there is little understanding at a governmental level as to what that looks like on the ground implementation of it. And I think equally with climate change, if you think about drought upon drought upon drought in Australia and the mental health impact of on farmers, their whole life and generations of farmers. So it's this applica it's it's we don't find that there is the connector. So IFA is a connector between, oh, you know, vaccination actually needs to be talking to aging and climate change needs to be talking to. So do you get that same sense in your work in public health ethics? Yeah, so again, it's uh, you know, most of uh trying to connect dots of a complex, wicked problem. And uh, one of the things that we learned in, 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 in SARS-1 is that sometimes you need a, a bit of a, so we, we always use this image of a compass, the moral compass. Um, we live in a, uh, in a culture that is uh, committed to positivism and evidence-based approach, uh, which you know, I understand the reasons for that. Um, but it is not the case that values are soft, squishy, and entirely subjective. In fact, they provide often a broad base of, agree of, of agreement. Um, and uh, they can actually help you out in times uh, wh where there's high uncertainty. And you know, a pandemic where there is no evidence to work upon, that's where you say, well, what would be our goals and what would be our objectives and what would be the animating values? And so you know, the reason why we are concerned about mortality and morbidity is that as humans, we don't like to see others suffer if it can be prevented. Uh, or uh, if they do become ill, we like to find a way to, uh, you know, uh, palliate or remediate that. Those are, that's the very foundation. The very foundation of healthcare is moral through and through. There is nothing on an objective rendering of the life world that would tell you why a human life has value over that of a squirrel or a protozoan. Right. So uh, 
if we're going to be committed to things like, uh, um, you know, and it, I'll, I'll come back to my earlier years in environmental ethics and working in the uh, desiccated Aral Sea area, if you want to see the impact of climate change and, you know, the destruction of intergenerational ways of, of holding one's uh, life together. So we need to understand that. Uh, uh, and so one of the ones that are quickly or often, uh, and this will speak to your question, is equal moral concern. Um, and so if you look at how, you know, everybody knows that they're rights bearing individuals because there's a universal declaration of human rights, which was the culmination of 200 years of thinking uh, from the enlightenment, which actually uh, said that individuals have certain inherent properties by virtue and, and these are rights and these rights need to be respected and upheld. So there's, there's all of that. But underlying the rights, which is kind of turned into a legalistic uh, concept, is a moral concept of equal moral concern. That is, every life has equal value and requires equal uh, consideration, all things being considered. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, older women have equal moral concern. In fact, I think we need to start uh, drawing from indigenous traditions and uh, giving due weight to uh, uh, the wisdom and views of elders as moderating forces for some of the uh, not not just because I'm getting old now, but <laughs> but uh, you know there, there's there's wisdom in that because it's it's a way of bringing different perspectives together. Maybe. So that would be one thought. All right. Look, thank you for that. I'm going to turn and ask um, several people who are at the Global Cafe to come forward with a couple of questions. But just to give you a question on notice, I'm going to come back to you and ask you if we can actually adapt the Upshur principles to some of the issues that we're dealing with. So I just read an article this morning where the Upshur principles were quoted when it yeah. comes to driving. So I'm going to come back to that. that. That's a paper I regret writing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, you can regret it afterwards, but I'm yes, going to... If you know, you're around long enough, your words come back to haunt you. <laughs> they do. I know that one. So, Danielle, uh, Danielle Goodman, you've made several comments. Uh, do you have a question for Ross this morning? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor. Thank you so much. I really resonate with what you're saying, and I really empathize with your frustration. Um, would, I, I, I was compelled by that idea of unlimited community. What was the name of that person again? And my question is, do you think that austerity is incompatible with adequate public health provision? Okay, so the, the thinker is Charles Saunders Peirce, and it's in an essay he wrote on uh, the nature of probability. And I can send the uh, reference to Jane uh, for distribution. Uh, it's, it's a surprising, interesting uh, um, uh, 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 argument. Austerity, yeah, um, that's, a, that's a, a great question. It depends on, on, on who the um, uh, person issuing the, uh, uh, and person, person's perspective, uh, issuing the uh, edicts of austerity are, right? Because really what austerity uh, indicates is a species of uh, allocation, right? Resource allocation, priority setting. And, and usually the idea behind austerity is that we don't have enough to go around, uh, therefore we're going to radically cut uh, you typically have then uh, arguments based in some form of consequentialism, usually some crude form of utilitarianism, uh, saying if you can't demonstrate efficiencies in X, Y, or Z, or cost efficiencies, and, and all of this presented as if it's some form of absolute objective science, uh, that will drive the agenda. And, you know, I've been around long enough, we've seen that before. Um, so there are other ways of thinking about being austere. Uh, for example, we could be austere with respect to our use of plastics and, uh, uh, and uh, hydrocarbon-based products. We could be austere with respect to our consumption of uh, uh, certain goods. And uh, that would have the, you know, the same cost effectiveness, cost efficiency uh, arguments uh, would actually demonstrate uh, longer term uh, benefits. So, so whenever I hear the word austere, I uh, always ask the question. So this is, there's this, uh, in, in interpretation theory, there's these twin poles. There's the hermeneutics of suspicion and the principle of charity. 
the principle of charity holds that when you're listening to an argument or a presentation or reading something, you interpret it in the best light possible. So if you see some flaws in the argumentation, you kind of bolster up the uh, premises and see if it still holds. The other pole is the hermeneutics of suspicion, where you don't believe a word and you're looking, you know, you're looking behind uh, every utterance to see what, you know, cloaked interests exist. So austerity is when people start using the austerity world or austerity arguments is one where the principle of charity has no room. Only the hermeneutics of suspicion uh, obtain because you need to understand whose interests are being best served by calls for austerity. And of course, you made several comments during SARS, which are applicable now around scarce resources. Yes. And, and where do they go and to whom and for what reason? And so, by what process, right? So and by again, what process? Uh, um, you know, attention to procedural justice, we found, uh, is, is actually critically important, particularly in allocation decisions. So if, if uh, you know, I used to think that <laughs> I can't use this analogy anymore because of all of the craziness south of the border, but um, I used to use fair elections as the idea of how you illustrate uh, procedural justice. So you may have a strong commitment to a particular po political party, but in a democratically held vote, um, if the other party wins, you won't be happy, but you will abide by that decision because you have been satisfied that the um, you know, conditions of procedural justice have been met. Uh, unfortunately, it's a whole nother topic. Our, our confidence in, in, in that construction of how things go has been uh, rather severely tested over the past couple of years. And, and of course, culture plays a big role from country to country as to the allocation and the procedural processes of allocation. Yeah, and, and this is, this is, that's a great, great, great question. Um, and uh, the issue of culture and how it mediates with kind of universal principles has been something that's been, uh, you know, tested time and time again uh, with uh, human rights. But I think we may have general consensus that certain allocation approaches probably don't meet the standard of ethics, right? Uh, and, and that might hold in, in multiple cultures. Uh, so, uh, you know, d d deciding on the basis of favoritism or hair color or any number of things uh, probably is, uh, fails to meet the standard. But then of course, you're right, there are many uh, mediating factors that do come into play. Look, thank you for that. We've got two more questions, uh, Denise Zwang, and then I'll go to Francis Wilkinson. So Denise, would you like to come forward and ask your question? I, I asked actually Ross Upshur this question at his um, IFA talk back in 2020. So I will ask it again to see if there's some new information. Uh, what lessons have we learned about our duty to care for persons with dementia, not just during a pandemic, but after the pandemic, the results, what is our duty to care right now after their decline? Is that included in the consideration? Well, if it isn't, it ought to be. Again, back to that principle of equal uh, moral you know, status or equal moral concern. Um, there's nothing in a pandemic that makes somebody with dementia uh, less deserving of care uh, than in a, a non-pandemic. Uh, the problem again is back to how we allocated resources and some, I think one of the lessons, and I'm not sure whether we'll learn them. So again, uh, I, I'm, I'm anxious to see. So, you know, SARS was actually in retrospect, SARS-1 was a small localized experience that generated uh, numerous reports. I, I have a pool with friends as to how long the shelf space will be uh, for all of the commissions of inquiry for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so I, I think, uh, we, I, I would hope um, that there would be some recommendations that we not uh, repeat and recapitulate uh, what happened to, uh, you know, people with cognitive difficulties in long-term care facilities ever again, right? I mean, today is Remembrance Day. Uh, we should have a Remembrance Day, for, you know, uh, for uh, what happened in long-term care facilities. Uh, Around the world around the world, yeah, yeah. Canada was particularly egregious, right? 
So if there's no one to hold some, you know, I've really started to, you know, think what are the best ways to do this? You know, it's not through the type of work I do, right? Like I'm a pointy headed academic. I can't not sit down and, you know, do things in a particular way. But there are many creative people out there who work with symbols, with culture, with art, uh, that might be a more effective way of actually holding in mind uh, some of the responsibilities that we have. And, you know, I mean, that, that's what the, the poppy is a symbol of, right? It, it symbolizes a, a, a whole constellation of ideas about human life and human suffering. And, you know, that lest we forget, um, you know, is a powerful statement. So we need some sort of pandemic, lest we forget symbol that would encapsulate all of the horrors that were experienced on our population over the past two years with a forward symbol that, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that things could get worse. Um, and we need to be, uh, we need resolve. We need to be prepared. Uh, uh, we need to be serious about these issues and, and, and teach next generations about the seriousness of these uh, challenges and the fact that they have the, a role to play. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a cranky old man, but, you know, TikTok doesn't prepare uh, the next generations for the very weighty and difficult uh, uh, challenges that face us. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, so um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but if you know artists or sculptors or painters or poets, right? I mean, uh, you know, think of the poetry that we still recite on, on, on Remembrance Day. Uh, so we have literature, we have symbolism, and you know, one day a year, we reflect upon it. You know, World War I was a terror on my family tree. Only my, uh, you know, grandfather emerged from it. Uh, uh, and he was gassed and, and uh, died a couple of years uh, after, uh, leaving my father, you know, fatherless as a very uh, young boy. Um, so, you know, thinking about that has all of those interrelated memories. And you think of the trenches and the gas and the, you know, destruction of property. So we need something, not arguments, not, you know, upshore principles. We need art, we need symbols, we need something that constellates people's understanding in a very uh, distinct way so that we can keep it in memory. And that will be one of our takeaway actions, Ross. Um, and I, you may have just escaped question about the upshare principles. <laughs> so um, Francis Wilkinson, you've got a great question for Ross. Yes. Um, I wanted to raise the question of stigma, which happens in most epidemics. And in Toronto during SARS-1, we were very cautious about what was said in the news about who was ill because it was largely limited, at least early, to one ethnic community. And as a result, you rarely saw things in the paper about the people that died and so on. And I think this carried over to um, COVID because if you actually read obituaries in Toronto, either in the Star or in the Globe and Mail, you would hardly ever see the word COVID. And I suspect this was actually policy. So in fact, in Toronto, we've just had an epidemic of peacefulness, which was really strange, but if you read the newspaper, all these elderly people suddenly passed away peacefully. And I think historically in a hundred years when people look at what happened in Toronto, they're going to be scratching their heads saying, what was this? And I think we have this way of trying to forget. I mean, I used to teach a course about epidemics and nobody had heard about 1918 yeah, yeah. until COVID started. And so I think there's a desire to suppress and a, um, desire to not talk about it. And I think that has a big piece of why we don't develop policies. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree entirely, Francis. So uh, in, a, in another presentation I give, I talk about my pursuit of the least unit of collective human memory, uh, because, you know, already within uh, this pandemic since 2020, you know the forgetting starting when you get questions from the media 
that were asked and answered two years, like, really? You know, did you not remember the answer the last time? Stigma, that's, a, that's, a, that's another great one. So as I say, when I entered public health in the uh, early 90s was uh, at the, you know, ascent of the HIV uh, pandemic. And of course, uh, stigma was an issue. And it's, it's a topic that we have, another topic that we have not moved the dial one iota not one iota in the 30 years that I've been working in public health and on epidemics. And, uh, uh, you know, monkeypox, uh, we've got a, our, our working group now. <laughs> okay, another public health emergency of international concern. I think my monkeypox may be the last one I work on because after this, you know, like this. Uh, uh, and so what was the first issue that was raised at the table? The first weighty concern, stigma. So we have, we have not got our minds around stigma in any way, shape or form, despite the fact, again, it's back to that same framing. Oh, vulnerable populations are gonna be most adversely affected. We've known that from time immemorial. Stigma, you know, there's a huge, the social science literature is filled with beautiful, uh, insightful analyses of stigma and how it plays out from the, you know, the original work, I think by Irving Goffman to the present, right? Um, so everybody knows about stigma, but nobody does anything about it, right? So anti-stigma efforts have been largely absent. And so every, you know, so yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely correct. And you're absolutely correct about forgetfulness. Uh, and so maybe this is just who we are as a species. And I ought to just like not get so worked up. <laughs> and just, you know, so, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. You know, I think the, the worked up people just need to come together. So I'm on your team, Ross. I'm, I, I know, and I'm tired of being worked up about the same issues that we've been talking about and the challenge, not the challenge, not being able to move them into action. So I'm going to pause there for a minute and ask you to think about a couple of takeaway messages for our colleagues today while I just introduce next week's um, speaker. So I'll come back to you in just a minute, Ross. Um, I'll have the great pleasure of uh, talking with George Lee next week at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday. And George Lee is not only a designer, a podcast host and international speaker, you know, she is part of the installation of the Design Aging Institute. And we talked with Colm Lowe several weeks ago. So the topic of our conversation will be age on trial. So join with us, um, George and I, in conversation next week to actually unpack what she means by age on trial and all the work that she's been doing around bringing design and ageing and education together. So please join with us. Now, Ross, one of the things that really irks me in intergovernmental agendas, and I can name half a dozen, and it's this phrase, leave no one behind. Now, I don't know whether anybody realises, but we've left them behind and we continue to leave them behind. And the more that we actually normalise this words of yeah. leaving people behind, we are not going to be moving forward. And so today, what you've done for me is I've learnt new things but you've also energised me again to be that person that's less polite and shouts a lot more. <laughs> now, whether that does any good or not, um, but I probably will sleep a little better by shouting a bit louder. So, yeah, so, Ross, so I think... So, Jenna, I was going to quick, you know what leave no one behind means is, leave, is really leave no one behind to count and take account of uh, what's happened. That's exactly right. So, please... Um, you know, just just take this session out with a couple of messages that we can, you know, hold the baton high and move forward with. Okay, so I, I think we can do better, and we must do better. And I think all of the elements of what we need to say and do is known and well known. Uh, I think we just need to have the collective will uh, to do it. And that means I think, Jane, just as you say, when you're in the um, presence of policy makers and decision makers, or you're wandering through the Byzantine layers to figure out who's making the decisions, uh, you know, let them know uh, long, loudly and clearly what's at stake. 
Um, if you're involved in health professions education, advocate for that five minutes that I've asked for. Um, if you have uh, any artistic skill whatsoever, uh, start to find, you know, because think of I'm working on this paper on the meme, right? This was a graphic designer who just put a line across for no reason, and it became the, it went on Twitter and became the galvanizing goal of pandemic response, which I find really interesting and frightening. But think about that on the positive side. If you could develop a symbol that galvanized uh, concern and action uh, like the poppy to draw attention to our failings from several pandemics uh, that may in fact uh, uh, help us in the future, that would be a good thing. Uh, but be prepared, we have very serious and stern challenges ahead of us and we need to be fully engaged uh, if we want to uh, be a viable species on this planet. Look, Ross, thank you very much. Already people in the chat box have said, we need a dose of Ross every year. So um, be sure that we'll be inviting you back next year. And perhaps we can take that idea of symbolism and go back to the Design Aging Institute, yeah. which is, belongs to the Royal Hel Helen Hamlin and talk with them about that. Because if we can have this brooch that symbolizes SDGs, then I think that we actually need, you know, something, a badge, a symbol that actually represents lives lost, but also lives changed. Ross? And a TikTok. Get somebody to do a TikTok. <laughs> and, and of course, the TikTok. I've yet yeah. to get to that, but I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much once again for being with us. And I'd also like to thank the talented and gifted team at the IFA and particularly Luana and Bruna to supporting these important global conversations every single week. So thanks, Ross. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Nice to see everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.